actually there are two, as far as I can see, there are two forces in the world that are, are attempting to uh, carry out the, in my view, quite ludicrous attempt to identify the Soviet Union with communism. One is the Soviet leadership itself, which is trying to exploit the uh, uh, the positive image of the uh, uh, of the egalitarian communist tradition for their own benefit, and the other is the United States, the American propaganda system, which is uh, which also would like to undermine that egalitarian vision by associating it with Russian totalitarianism. But I don't think that we should. And, and, and you're right. I mean, this leads to a situation in which the values of uh, the egalitarian socialist tradition, the libertarian egalitarian socialist tradition, are associated in the American mind with the brutal and repressive Soviet state, which in my view has nothing whatsoever to do with communism or anything, that, no connection with it. And these things, I think, very much should be dissociated. So I wouldn't think that, uh, uh, I, I don't, I, I, for example, I think the American people have very good reason, or everyone has good reason, to fear the Russian state, which is a violent and repressive and brutal autocracy. On the one hand, there's the question of what kind of a society the Soviet Union is. And I think we would, I, I doubt if either of us would disagree in any serious way with what Marshall just said. You know, it's a highly repressive society which has a kind of social contract that puts a floor under certain kinds of suffering. Okay, that's the kind of society it is. Separate question is what kind of a threat it poses. Those are se very entirely separate questions. I mean, you could have the most brutal, murderous society internally, which just wouldn't happen to be a threat out outside. You could have the freest, it's, in fact, through history, there has been no correlation between, that I can detect, between the internal freedom of a society and its violence and aggression abroad. For example, England was the freest country in the world in the 19th century. And in India, it acted like the Nazis did. You know, the United States is, the, in my view, the most open, politically speaking, for getting social issues and so on. It's the most open and freest society in the world. And it also has the most brutal record of violence and aggression in the world. Now, these things are just uncorrelated. Now, if you look at the Soviet Union, it seems to me, yes, it is a repressive and, uh, you know, dissent is suppressed. And it's, in my view, it's a dungeon. It's kind of a dungeon with a certain degree of social services. Now, uh, and it, it is also a threat. It's a threat to its, the government. It's a threat to its own population. It's a threat to, in fact, anyone within its reach. But its reach doesn't happen to be very long. I mean, its reach is far shorter than we claim it to be. So for, for, for the population of the Soviet Union, for Eastern Europe, for Afghanistan, uh, the Soviet Union is a real threat. And I don't see how anybody can question that. On the other hand, the United States has created the image of a Soviet threat just for the same reason that they create an image of an American threat as a way for us to justify intervention and aggression in our own domains. And in fact, if you look over the history of the Cold War, I think this is transparent. Take any incident of the Cold War, you know, from the American in intervention in Greece in 1947 up to today in Nicaragua, and you will find that every single time a Soviet threat has been created and usually fabricated, to justify American intervention. And incidentally, they play precisely the same game. We started off, though, uh, uh, talking about the internal uh, system in the Soviet Union, the degree to which it's a repressive society, because that's certainly the perception of most Americans. But in what sense, if any, does that, uh, uh, is that related to its behavior vis-a-vis -vis other nations as well as its own people? Because for example, I think many people believe uh, you can't trust the Russians. Uh, they never, uh, uh, they never abide by treaties. Uh, they never keep their promises. They're really not a nation like other nations. They're not part of the community of nations. They're they're a How special. How about trying breed. this? They, the Russians don't keep their promises because they are a nation like other nations. In <laughs> fact, the fact is anyone who believes the promises of any nation state is out of their minds or just doesn't know anything about history. And that includes us and every other one. I, so. I mean, you know, states follow their promises if it's in their interest to do so. Uh, if you look at the history of the arms race, there's just no doubt that the United States had the initiative. But I don't, but the reason for that I think is very simple. We're a more powerful or more technologically advanced country. So, of course, we're going to always have the more advanced military technology. I think that the, the main thrust, the main pressure for militarization and the arms race in the Soviet Union comes from the internal dynamics of the society. I mean, I think once we dissociate our discussion from what, in my view, are kind of irrelevant considerations, like you know, whether nations abide by their states, abide by their treaties, and so on, no, of course they don't. And we ask ourselves, what, are the con concrete what is the concrete situation today? I think what we see is that the United States is deeply committed 
to a uh, massive program of domestic militarization for the same kinds of reasons that drove it in 1961 and that drove it in 1950 and that have nothing to do with any perceived international threat. And we ought to understand that. If we want to know, I mean, I think it's very clear, I think it's, 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 you know, the Reagan administration came, is the, the, the programs that the Reagan administration is following were in fact proposed in late 1978, but they couldn't be pushed through Congress at that time. Uh, Reagan extended them and accelerated them. Any modern industrial society uh, it, it, uh, rec has recognized since the 1940s that the way to deal with internal economic problems is through state intervention. I mean, the institutional structures of American society happen to be such that there is no coordinated state planning. Yeah. We don't have the system that they have in Japan, where there's uh, a, a government ministry right. which deals with, you know, with uh, highly centralized uh, 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 foci of industry and brings them together and makes a long-term economic plan. We don't, we don't have the institutional structure for that. We have a different institutional structure. Our institutional structure, as it's developed since the Second World War, is that the technique by which the government stimulates production is by creating a, a state-guaranteed market. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that the Russians, in, in their international behavior, behave very much like any other power, including us. I mean, every power, great or small, tries to extend uh, the influence of its, uh, the extent of its degree to coerce and control and penetrate markets and so on and so forth, get resources. Uh, we happen to be the world's most powerful force. In the early post-war period, we were overwhelmingly the world's most powerful force, and therefore the United States did, in fact, we can easily document this, both in the documentary record and the historical record, the United States did, in fact, set forth on a policy of global domination. Uh, and it succeeded to a surprising extent. Uh, since that period, the, and, and the Russians did so also in their much sp smaller sphere. Now, since that period, this bipolar system has, in fact, eroded. I mean, other powers have developed, uh, Europe, Japan, elements of the third world. And in fact, the degree of the two superpowers to coerce and control us in our huge domains and them in their smaller domains, that has declined. Every society perceives itself or tries to make its public perceive itself as benevolent. I mean, the British were carrying the white man's burden and the French had a civilizing mission and the Russians are doing their internationalist duty when they, inter when they invade Afghanistan and the United States is preserving democracy. And all of this, I mean, we are as much interested in democracy as the Russians are interested in socialism. In I, I, fact, we, you know, over and over again have overthrown democratic regimes uh, if they didn't do the kind of thing we wanted them to do. I mean, there has, study after study has revealed the obvious, namely that American support and aid correlates with essentially with the improvement of the investment climate. If a country is willing to open itself to our penetration and control our access to resources, allow our corporations to repatriate profits and so on, we will support them. It doesn't matter what kind of regime they have. Uh, how, how, do you, uh, how do you respond to uh, the situation in Central America in terms of uh, Soviet either uh, influence or Soviet active involvement? Uh, so, Tony, you know, uh, this discussion reminds me of, uh, you know, the standard joke about have you stopped beating your wife. I mean, there's a presupposition here which is so grotesquely false that even to answer your question is impossible. I mean, it's as if there was a discussion going on in the Soviet Union where they asked, what's the extent of American intervention in Eastern Europe? Well, okay, maybe they have discussions about that, and if we looked at them, we would laugh. I mean, okay, maybe there's some intervention in Eastern Europe, but that's not the problem in Eastern Europe. And the problem in Eastern Europe is Russian domination. Now, take a look at Latin America. I mean, Latin America has been subjected to American-supported, U.S.-supported terrorism and violence uh, to a degree that is, uh, I mean, unspeakable, you know? Uh, I mean, in, in 19... I mean, let's forget about history. In, in 1961, the Kennedy administration made one of the most important decisions in modern history, which almost nobody in the United States knows about. Namely, they changed the mission of the Latin American military from uh, hemispheric defense, presumably against the Martians, to internal security, meaning war against their own populations. And that decision led to a spread of a plague of bloodshed and repression and torture and violence over Latin America that has no, no precedent in the whole bloody history of the continent. As country after country was turned over to national security states with a kind of a Nazi model, and I mean that quite literally, under, with constant American intervention and support. Now, now we look at that history 
And then we ask, what is the extent of Russian intervention in Latin America? We should tell the truth about the Russians. We should understand how repressive they are. We should understand how brutal they are and how aggressive they would be if they could get away with it, which they can't in most places. But if you look at the Russian military system, the fact is that it's, it's, its character is wildly exaggerated in American propaganda. And in fact, all of this has been exposed. It's been exposed over and over again, and, it has, and the exposure has no effect. So for example, take the way in which Take the way, I mean, for, for one thing, take, take the way in which the, the United States determines the, the character of the Soviet military system. I mean, this, is, this is such a, you know, this is so farcical that people who know about it just laugh. I mean, the, what we do is the CIA calculates what's called the dollar equivalent of the Russian military expenditures. That means we ask how much would it cost us to produce the Russian military system? And the answer is some huge number. The reason it's some huge number is that they're so hopelessly inefficient. I mean, that's a labor-intensive system, backward labor-intensive system. And for us to create a backward labor-intensive system would be extremely expensive. I mean, for example, if you ask the question, what would it co what's the dollar equivalent of the Russian agricultural system? Suppose somebody asked that. What would it cost us to duplicate the Russian agricultural system? Well, the answer is it would bankrupt us. You know, if we had to, if we had to pay you know, a hundred million peasants to farm inefficiently, it would just be would bankrupt. Yeah, but but we don't, excuse me, we don't conclude from that that the Russians are more, are better, are ahead of us in agriculture. Now, the fact is, suppose you were to ask, what is the ruble equivalent of the American military system? Well, we do. Just, we, uh, but you know what the answer is? Uh, the the answer is that it's infinite. Yes. Yeah, because the Russians simply cannot duplicate our military system. If they could spend every, every ruble they have in Russia, and they can't duplicate our military system because it's just too advanced for them. We can't create, we, we cannot create initiatives in the Soviet Union, so it's pointless to discuss it. We can ask, what can we do here? Now, what we do here, if we want to be logical about it, has to be directed at two ends, at cutting down the American commitment to the arms race and at cutting down the Russian commitment to the arms race. And fortunately, the very same actions uh, uh, contribute to both of those ends. For, now, just consider for a minute the dynamics of this system. We know that every time the Russians do something aggressive, it supports the hawks on our side, and every time they back off somewhere, it hurts the hawks on our side, and the system is mutual, it's symmetrical. So the fact of the matter is that the best way in which we can contribute to the reduction of aggression and militarism in the Soviet Union is by constraining our own militarism and aggression, which their hawks use, just as ours do, as a way of mobilizing their own populations. And in fact, my view is that's why the Cold War persists. In fact, it is highly functional for the more brutal and militaristic elements in both societies.